Hello everyone. Welcome to the first little video from the Friends of the Wedna Road Cemetery. Wedna Road Cemetery is a disused Victorian burial ground to the west of the town of Bridgewater in Somerset in the southwest of England, which was in use from 1851 and fell out of use from the 1950s. The Friends are working to preserve the cemetery, remember those buried there, and help it function as a quiet garden park for the local community. The reason for this video is because of the coronavirus. It's currently April 2020, and because of the lockdown, we had to cancel a series of talks and walks in the cemetery for the next year at least, as well as an exhibition in the Blake Museum, which was to celebrate 10 years of the work of the Friends. Our volunteer working parties have also had to cease, so in lieu of that and all those activities, we thought it might be an idea to bring these talks to you. So over the coming weeks and months, we're hoping to put together a few videos exploring the history of the cemetery and all the work the Friends have been doing since we founded in 2010. I was due to give a talk in the Blake Museum on the recent research about the cemetery, which was due to happen on the 12th of May. So I intend to give that talk, but I intend to work up to it first because I'm conscious not everyone may have heard me talk about this before. Rather than full hour-long lectures, which will be exhausting for both of us, we'll release these talks in little chunks. Uh, and before we go ahead, do forgive the sound quality in this video. The microphone is somewhat improvised. So uh, these first two talks I intend to give will look at the history of burial in Bridgewater before the Wenner Road Cemetery was formed in 1851. So this first one I want to do is on the history or the known history of burial in medieval Bridgewater. And then next time we'll move on to uh, the Reformation and building up a picture of burial in Bridgewater up to the 1840s and 1850s. Uh, do feel free to ask any questions of us either in the comment section here or on our Facebook page and I'll post any corrections or comments uh, in the next video. If you could subscribe to this channel and like and share etc it would be a huge help to us. Uh, I've also added a link in the description to our members page on the website which will detail how you can help support the Friends. So, to the history of burial in Bridgewater. We'll keep our focus to the town of Bridgewater for the most part and exclude most of the wider district. But to begin with, we'll have a quick look at the village of Wemden, which adjoins Bridgewater, and we have about a thousand years of history to play with. The oldest evidence we have for burials in the Bridgewater area are on top of Wembling Hill. The majority of the burials discovered on top of Wembling Hill, which are below houses and gardens now, at the crest of the hill on the Bridgewater side, these seem to indicate use from at least the 7th century through to about the 10th. These photographs were taken by David Baker, the local archaeologist, a very important man, uh, during the excavations there in the back gardens of a couple of properties in 1987. So who were the people buried there? Well, they were probably Britons. The English, that is the Anglo-Saxons, didn't arrive in the area until about 658, when the border between the Brythonic Kingdom of Deponia and the West Saxon Kingdom of Wessex became the River Parrot. It was only after 682 that Wessex expanded eastwards and the west of the River Parrot became English. As the cemetery seems to have continued in use across this period, it seems that the locals just adapted from new overlords and just got on with things. The burials all seem to be Christian as well. The Britons of Somerset had long been converted under the Romans, and by this time the West Saxons, when they had arrived in the neighbourhood, they too had given up their old pagan ways. Each burial was aligned east-west with the head placed in the east. There were no grave goods aside from a shroud pin. The main things to keep in mind with the burial ground, which will be important for the rest of the burials which we find in the Bridgewater area, is that you can see that each of these burials took place as one person buried in one plot. You didn't have multiple burials going into the same area. Now, this is important to remember because a key part of medieval Christianity is the notion that, come doomsday, everyone would arise from the grave for the final judgment. And that is exactly what these people were waiting for. We have no idea why this burial ground fell out of use and why the parish church of Wemden isn't sited on top of Wemden Hill, like something like Glastonbury Tor or Borough Mump. 
When first built, Wendron Church was on the edge of the marsh, at the head of a causeway that led to Crowpill, but we don't have much evidence about it otherwise. Before we turn our focus to Bridgewater, we'll pause briefly at two odd places between the village and the town, as both of them are relevant to our story. The first is in Orchard Lane. This is worth noting for two reasons. The first for the finding there in the 19th century of a large stone coffin. Why this was there is a mystery. We might assume that it was dragged from Bridgewater after the Middle Ages for use as a horse trough, but for one tantalising piece of evidence. The field opposite the Kidsby Ream is noted in the tithe apportionment map for the area as called Gallows. Now this might be because it just belonged to a man named Gallo, which isn't impossible, but it might also hint towards the site being a place of execution. Uh, but for now this remains a mystery, it's just something to sort of flag up as relevant. Second, we can go to Victoria Road and the equally mysterious Jews Churchyard. In the 19th century, this field, now occupied by two houses on Victoria Road and the new Victoria Centre behind it, were known as the Jews Churchyard. This probably had nothing to do with Jews, as there were only three Jews in medieval Bridgewater before they were expelled by King Edward I. In 1540, the site was recorded instead as Yun Churchyard, that's E-U-Y-N which is even more puzzling. This name is quite odd. It might have something to do with yew trees. It might be somebody called Ewan. That this piece of land was called a churchyard is interesting. Kidsbury was a lost medieval settlement which ran along what is now Kidsbury Road up to the old farm, which was once, it seems, a moated manor house. There may have been an attempt to build a chapel on this site before the settlement uh, wound itself up in the later Middle Ages. Even the name of Kidsbury is tantalising. The two elements mean something like the fort belonging to a man called Kidder uh, in Old English. Sadly, no archaeology was done when the farm was demolished, and none at all was done when the Victoria Centre was built over the supposed Jews' churchyard. So all this remains a puzzle. We can now move on to the town of Bridgewater itself. Now, a lot of what I say over uh, the next few minutes will be an oversimplification, and I defer entirely to anything about medieval Bridgewater to the historian Hannah West, who is the, the real expert. What I present here is just a synthesis of scraps of information I've been told over the years. So, Bridgewater was founded as a town in about the year 1200, although it had existed uh, for an indefinite time beforehand uh, as an Anglo-Saxon um, farmstead, for want of a better word. It had probably been set around an Anglo-Saxon bridge on an important east-west route. In 1089, the name was Brugge, what the French writers of the Doomsday Book recorded it as, which may be a corruption, but the name literally means just essentially bridge in Old English. After the Norman conquest, uh, a Norman fella called Walter of Douai uh, took possession of the place and his forename was tacked onto the place name to differentiate this bridge from all the others in the area, hence Bridgewater, or Bridgewater. Over time, the L of Bridgewater uh, was lost from the spelling, although not from the West Country pronunciation, Bridgewater. The middle E was optional until the mid-19th century, uh, and now you must never include the middle E at all. So our next place of burial is St Mary's Church. The first reference we have for a church in Bridgewater is between 1088 and 11. 07. This would eventually become St Mary's Parish Church that we know today, although we're not 100% certain it was on the same site. We just know there was a church. It was probably sited where it is now, certainly by the year 1200, when the core of the town was laid out uh, as a piece of um, medieval town planning, when the church, marketplace and castle were certainly definitely located. Now a bit of priming about medieval Christianity and the notion of intercession. Medieval folk had an active interaction with the dead. You could help the dead and the dead could help you. First, they developed an idea called purgatory, which is where most folk would go to after they died, where their minor sins would be burned away before proceeding to heaven. It was an unpleasant place and you would want to be out of it as soon as possible. And they developed ways for you to have insurance policies about this so you can have prayers and masses devoted to your memory after you died which would help you proceed through purgatory. Second there was the notion of the saints. These were dead people you could pray to 
who would help you in your everyday life. And we get some sense of this in St Mary's Church, where we find altars to various saints, which included uh, St Mary, which is St Mary, the mother of Jesus, the Virgin Saint, St Catherine, who was a martyr, who was held as uh, an ideal of womanhood. There was St George, the fighting saint, who became especially popular uh, in crusading culture. There was St Erasmus, also known as St Elmo, who was the patron saint of sailors, who we might expect uh, in a port town such as Bridgewater. So in this system, the dead weren't really dead. They were just at the next stage and you could help them and they could help you. Now, although medieval folk initially wanted to lie undisturbed so that they could rise again on the resurrection morning, sharp practicalities had to be accounted for eventually. After all, the typical half acre of a standard churchyard would rapidly fill up, especially if they were in town environment. So most of the townsfolk would have been buried in the churchyard of St Mary's, and after about 100 years after they've been forgotten about, the grave would be reopened and whatever was found in there would be dug up and the grave reused. Three things would happen. First is a new burial would go on top of an old one. Second, you dig down and all the bones you would find on the way down, you would dig into a small pit at the bottom of the grave and then you put the new burial on top of that. Third is you dig all the way down, take out all the bones and put them in the charnel house of the church. Now the charnel house of St Mary's is assumed to be through this little door on the side of St Mary's church on the north side. Uh, it's not clear if the medieval one was in exactly the same position, we're assuming it was. This is certainly where it ended up by the um, Victorian period. Now note the two niches on either side of the little door. They're depressingly weathered today and they're probably effigies commemorating the people who paid for this particular extension to the church. But what we've got going on here is the starting divergence between rich and poor. So presumably the rich people who paid for these effigies and this section of the church, they will presumably still be under those effigies, under the ground, under this extension of their church. Whereas the people in the churchyard, the less wealthy people, are dug up. They necessarily eventually will end up in the charnel house of St Mary's Church, just because you don't have an unlimited amount of space. So this will again be important and we'll see this divergence massively exacerbated after the Reformation and into the Victorian period, but it's worth flagging up now. So we're automatically having to diverge from the one person, one plot thing we saw up on Wembley Hill. Now there are two other important medieval burial sites in medieval Bridgewater uh, and these are semi-monastic institutions. The first was established in 1200 or a little after 1200 by Bridgewater's founder William de Brewer uh, which was located at the top of Eastover roughly on the corner of the junction with the Broadway. A medieval hospital was somewhere in between a hospital in our modern sense but also a hostel or a hotel. Uh, and all three words come from the same thing. So it was essentially a place for travellers to find hospitality on their journeys, but also for the needy to find aid. The Bridgewater Hospital of St John was an incredibly wealthy institution. They had a burial ground which has yielded lots of bones and burials have been found over the years when building work has taken place. A grave slab was found there in the 19th century, which we think is now in St Mary's Church. There was also found in the 19th century the lower half of a tomb effigy of someone clad in priestly robes, the toes of the shoes being sharply pointed and which were resting upon a lion. This was retrieved from ruins of the hospital and kept at Chilton Holden Priory in 1839, but sadly now its location is unknown. Likewise, on the other side of town uh, in the southwest of Bridgewater was the Franciscan Priory which was established in the 1240s. Again, the church of this was located roughly where the Broadway goes past Fryan Avenue, although we're not exactly certain. Again, quite a few burials have been discovered there over the years. Now, St Mary's, St John's and the Priory were the main institutions where burials took place, but there were at least two more known medieval burial places in Bridgewater. Now, the first is associated with Bridgewater Castle, on the side of where Chandos Street is today. So this was once the bank of the moat. So between the castle wall, you had a little bank and then the moat and then 
and green fields. So during excavations there in 1984, which found a huge foundation to around the tower for the corner of the castle, but they also surprisingly found a row of burials dug in relatively shadow graves along the bank of the moat, which was an incredible discovery, as these represent burials of people buried outside of society. This was unconsecrated ground. You needed to be buried in holy, uh, consecrated ground to get into purgatory, to get into heaven and so on, which means that these people are buried without a proper Christian burial. So they committed some sort of crime, and some sort of crime against God as well. Now, this covers a multitude of sins, of course. So we can maybe assume that some sort of judicial function associated with Bridgewater Castle. These are felons, traitors, rebels, whatever, um, who have been executed in the castle and then buried in the lip of the moat. Interestingly, they're not just out to be eaten by the crows. They are given a form of burial, at least. So they have some respect for the dead. Now, the second interesting burial feature in Bridgewater, in medieval Bridgewater, which will conclude this little tour, we can look to Mansion House Lane. This is just off the high street under this fairly inoffensive building. In the central Somerset Gazette of the 11th of August 1939, we find the following story, which goes as follows. Last week, while the work of reconstructing premises in Clare Street at the back of the offices of the Bridgewater Gaslight Company in High Street was in progress, the workmen unearthed a number of human bones about three feet below the surface of the floor. Mr W. H. Smith of High Street, who formerly lived there, states that the premises were considered to be 500 years old and about a century ago were a public house known as the Noah's Ark, outside of which was a painted sign of animals entering the ark. In an adjoining room to that where the bones were discovered, Mr. Smith found a beautiful oak ceiling about 30 years ago, and in the room above a solid oak floor. The windows were of bullseye glass with lead frames. The property is among the oldest in town, and it is considered that the bones may be several hundred years old. So we have burials below a late medieval building. What do we have going on here? Well, we might make the safe assumption that these burials were placed in the ground before the house was built. We know that the town's surviving medieval records that there was no religious institution in this area which might explain them. Instead, a possible excommunication may lie in something like the Black Death of 1349 or the other great mortalities of the Middle Ages, such as famine. So we can maybe assume that this piece of open ground, which may be somebody's back garden uh, at the time, may have been used as an emergency burial place for uh, a pit of burials. Now that's assuming that these burials are medieval. They might even be older than the town itself and the town street plan. Further scientific testing would be necessary to know for certain, but unfortunately we don't know where the bones are or if there are any more under the building. But we'll leave you with that mystery. It seems appropriate that during a pandemic we should stop here with a possible plague pit. So next time we'll move on to the Reformation and the explosion of little burial grounds throughout the town for the many religious movements that emerged after 1688 especially. Wishing you all the very best.